Well, I wasn't to know as we were thinking of going into Genesis and began before Christmas that the timing of world events and the timing of this chapter would kind of coincide. But I kind of feel that uh, there's very much a, a lesson from this chapter for, uh, for us as we think about the world that we're, uh, that, we're, uh, that we're in and what's going on across the world. Here's a, here's a question. You know, when things get worse and worse, we might wonder when or if God will ever intervene. What happens when enough is enough? You know that phrase, enough is enough. That's enough, you know, and you want to bring an end to something. Well, uh, will God intervene? Does God intervene? What happens when, when God calls time on mankind and, and does intervene? What, what happens? What does that look like? Well, soberly reminded for us, this morning from our passage, Genesis 6 through 9, this passage relating to the ancient world and the flood that God brought. This teaches us something of what God does when he eventually intervenes. You know, I'm sure there's many wanting and praying for some divine intervention right now that would end this war, misery and destruction in Ukraine. And, and we must pray on for that. But uh, as Tony reminded us in prayer, you know, it's not like conflict hasn't been in all of these other places, uh, both uh, aggression towards believers, but also conflicts that, that, that the West has had its hand in. And, uh, and as that verse in the Christmas carol that we just sung reminds us, you know, with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel strain of roll, 2,000 years of wrong for man at war with man, hears not the love song that they bring. Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. Will God ever intervene to bring man's inhumanity to man to an end? Well, Genesis 6 through 9 reminds us that there does come a time when God intervenes, when God says, enough is enough, and when he does act, but it is not a pretty picture. If, uh, if you want to know the truth of this, you need to uh, travel, perhaps not so far, but to places where you can see all the strata uh, at the coast sometimes. You know, maybe down at Sidmouth, you can, you can see it there, you know, in that, in that uh, area down there where there's fossils found. Because in the earth's history, in the sediments under our feet, is the record of what God did to the ancient world. It's the evidence of what happens when God's patience eventually runs out. And, and it's not a pretty story. The, the story we're, we're more familiar with is the, is the kind of Sunday school story or, the, or the, little, the story for the little ones. You know, you've been into those Christian bookshops and there's those nice little archy stories, doesn't there? You know, they're, they're not got paper in because they're for the very little ones and they're made out of hard cardboard and there's about six pages on it, you know. And on the front cover, there's this little mountain and there's this cute little ark and there's a couple of giraffes poking their heads out and, you know, a, an elephant waving its trunk and there's a, there's a puffy little cloud and a rainbow in the background kind of thing. Well, let me tell you, you know, if, if, if someone was to truly put a, a portrayal of the ancient world and then what God did to it in the flood, if they were to truly put that in a film, it, it, would, be ra it would be rated age 18. You know, you wouldn't show it to, to the Sunday school because it, it really is a horrific intervention into the world of man because ultimately that's what it takes. And that's what it will take in the final outcome, too. We've been uh, reading through Genesis, haven't we? In Genesis chapter 4 onwards, we've seen the scene uh, beginning to be set for, for the ancient world, haven't we? A Cain has killed his brother. He's the first human born to his parents, and yet he, he grows up to kill his brother. And the, the chapter continues by showing how he fathers an offspring as, as murderous as himself and yet worse, Lamech. And uh, whilst chapter 4 finishes with the faithful seed 
the replacement for Abel, Seth, who's born to Adam and Eve. And in Genesis chapter 5, we have that genealogy, don't we, of, of Seth down through Enoch, down to Noah. The reality is we come to a time when the Bible records that the whole world was condemned except just one man and his family of eight souls. We know the story, don't we, where, where Abraham intervenes for Sodom. Oh, Lord, what if you should find 50 souls there? Would you hold back? Oh, yes, I would hold back for 50 souls. Lord, permit me. What if there's 45? And he goes on, doesn't he, until he eventually pleads, what if there's 10 souls there? Would you hold back your judgment? Because he knows he's pleading for Lot's. And Lot's family there in Sodom. Oh, yes, if there's 10 souls there, I, I, I will deliver the city. You know, In the end, there aren't even 10 souls, and Lot has to be delivered out of it, isn't it? Here, here's a situation where the whole world is in view. And we're not talking a population of 150. You know, we're talking of a population, we were looking at it in Sunday school, where people lived and lived and lived for 900 odd years and fathered sons and daughters, had big families. We might only have a genealogy of the one line that comes through to Noah, but the world was a very populous world very quickly. And men began to multiply across the face of the earth, is what we're told here. And yet there's just one man and his family that God spares. That is a sober, sober thought in itself, isn't it? But also, it's a thought that has just a tiny seed of hope as well to it. God didn't give up completely. He, he did a restart, didn't he? That it might be different after the flood than before. Well, first in this chapter, we see a theme of multiplication, don't we? It says in chapter 6 and verse 1, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, God had blessed man and, and said, be fruitful and multiply. And so it was only natural that this, this abundant new world uh, should be filled with people. That was God's original intent. And we read it there in chapter 6 and verse 1. But, but remember, chapter 5 had told us, following the fall into sin, that when men multiplied, they didn't just multiply in the image of God which is still latent in us, though very badly damaged, it says in chapter 5 and verse 3 that Adam begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth, that we reproduce after the sinful ways of our father. Having sinned, now the jelly mold is bashed, and so all the jellies that come out of it are deformed, are, are, are shaped and affected by sin. And so that was the problem, wasn't it? The multiplication of mankind didn't fill the earth with a world that reflects the goodness of God and the character of God and the grace of God and, and the wonder of God and, and all the characteristics that God had intended mankind to reflect. No, it reflected the corruption of sin and the cruelty of the evil one who had brought sin into this world. And it even seems that God's pattern for marriage, that one man and one woman should be joined together as one flesh was increasingly corrupted. And God holds these things precious. It's, it's interesting that this is one of the things that he picks up on here. Marriage is important for him. It says here in verse 2, for they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And we get the sense, just like Lamech, who, who was the first to have two wives, well, here, you know, they're multiplying them uh, and so on. And verse 5 tells us that man's wickedness multiplied in the earth. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of, of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What an awful indictment of the world. And yet one that we know, if we really think about it, is true, isn't it? Verse 11 and 12 says something similar. The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence and God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Well, this passage tells us about what God does when enough 
is enough. But I want to, I want to just deal with one interpretation uh, in this passage and an important principle before we come to that uh, aspect of what God does when enough is enough, because you'll have perhaps come across this in your reading, and so it's worth uh, just dealing with um, uh, this morning as well. So have a look at verse 4 of chapter 6. It says, Now there were giants on the earth in those days. And this is the word Nephilim. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. There are some that read this passage in this way. That at this point in the history of mankind, they read the phrase in verse 2, the sons of God, verse 2, saw the daughters of men. And they, th they read that phrase, sons of God, and because that phrase is used of angels in another place in the Bible, they say that this refers to angels, and it might. But the concept here is that somehow angels took over human bodies and a kind of crossbreed of giants was born. And there are kind of historic myths which speak of this kind of thing. In fact, if you were to read the book of Enoch and it's public domain, so you can go and read it yourself, um, you would come across a, a, a more developed narrative for this. Now, it isn't probably the book of Enoch, you know, Enoch we've got back there, but it's probably a book that's written, you know, very early on still and, and attributed to Enoch and, and that period of time. But we, we, we don't know. In that book, the angels are called the watchers. But they take these kind of elements together and, and, and go off into a bit of a tangent with them and say that the major reason for the flood was God's intention to, to wipe out this kind of crossbreed of, of giants that had emerged on, on the earth. And, and then they take that and say, and aha, look, you see them in Canaan as well. And, and God brings his kind of destructive intent upon the giants that occur in Canaan also. There's just one reference to Nephilim, and it's uh, Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33. You're welcome to look there if you like. You can just look it up. Uh, oh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Oh, I was going the wrong way. Numbers 13 and 33. Twice in this, in this verse it uses that word, but this, the, that is the last reference of it. It says, uh, so this is... Uh, um, uh, Moses relating, he says, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, so that's the word Nephilim, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Now, interestingly, um, the scripture does record that there's giants there, doesn't it? And in fact, when Israel came into the promised land, and they uh, were brought into battle, well, Og, king of Bashan, came out to fight against them, whom they defeated. Um, Moses reminds them that God defeated Og, king of Bashan, and that he was a giant. So if you were to flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11, it says this, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants verse 11, but it's not the word Nephilim, it's a different, a different word. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead, is it not in Rabat, of the people of Ammon? Nine cubits is its length and four cubits its width, according to the standard cubit. So he's reminding him of, of, of the bed that old king of Bashan lived in. Now, nine cubits is about 13 and a half feet. So if you know a six foot man, think of someone who's double that height. Now that is quite a giant, isn't it? That's quite a big person, you know. And, and uh, four cubits and, uh, uh, for the width of a bed is six foot. Okay, so he needed a big bed to sleep in and he needed an iron frame or it'd break and fall on the floor. You know, he's a big guy. Um, so, you know, the Bible does talk about giants, doesn't it? But it's, it's another thing to kind of construct a whole narrative that says this is why this happened and this is why. This. When the Bible tells us why this happened is that men became corrupt and were wicked and, and God was calling an, an end time to it. And the same was true in, in Canaan. That kind of reading is rather strange. And, and of course, to theologically explain how some 
how an angel would manage to father a giant by, you know, don't even need to go there. That is, that is a weird concept. And so I think all I'm saying is just be aware that there's people who, who take this passage and run with it in this manner, but I think it's an unusual interpretation. The more natural understanding is just simply this. The sons of God in verse 2 are simply the other sons born in the lineage of Seth through Noah, who were supposed to be the godly line, but they had become just as corrupt as the rest. So in Sunday school, we were in Genesis here thinking, and in Genesis 5, you, you've got that genealogy, haven't you? That Seth uh, fathers Enosh, you know, Enosh fathers Canaan, Canaan fathers uh, Mahalael, uh, Mahala El, or Mahal, whoever his name is, uh, you know, fathers Jared, Jared, uh, you know, it goes down the line until you, until you come to, to, to Noah. But all we have there is the one, isn't it? You know, and yet for all of them, it says, and they fathered fun, sons and daughters, other sons and daughters, but there's only just one that remains in the godly line. And, and we can, we, we, I think we should understand that, that though they were in, the godly line, as it were, the families of the descendants of, of, of Seth, and they should have been faithful to God. They weren't. Otherwise, why is it that only Noah and his family are saved in the ark? You know, the rest of Noah's brothers and sisters and, and uncles and aunties and, 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 the, and the rest of them, God, you know, who, who should have also listened uh, to, to, to Noah and stepped onto the, the ark and so on, they're, they're, they're not there, are they? So I think we can understand that there's, there's a contrast drawn in chapters 4 and 5 between the descendants of Cain and the, the sons of God, the sons in the godly line from Seth. The godly line was in danger of dying out, and therefore God's promise and his purpose was in danger of, dry, of dying out. And that's why we end up with just Noah who's left, who finds grace or favor in God's sight, verse 8. And so how do we understand verse 4? All verse 4 is telling us is, and there were giants on the earth in those days. Go back to the fossils, and there was giant dinosaurs. There were giant butterflies. There were giant lizards. There were giant beasts of the earth. It was a, an age before the flood, which was different to our age. It, it, was, a, it was a wonderful world. And the air pressures were different. The, the world, we were looking at it in Sunday school. The world that God first made, it says there was no sea. It was mainly land with seas. And, 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 and it's only after the flood that we end up with a world that's mainly seas with some land. And so it was different. It's interesting that in Revelation, when God brings about the renewed world, he brings it back and there's no more sea. You know, it's land, principally. So the world was different. And all it's saying is, is in, is in that population of those, you know, there, there were giants born. There was an article in the newspaper just recently of somebody who had a uh, fault, a kind of cancer type fault, but it wasn't cancer, in their pituitary gland. It was in the paper this last couple of weeks. You go home and look it up and you'll see. And even though he's in his 60s, this effect in his pituitary gland made, meant that he grew a foot taller in his 60s. Oh, when he, when he, you don't come across that, do you? you know, so there, there are things that are in our bodies that can change, that can stimulate this big growth. And basically, God is cutting us down to size. We're so wicked that we can't be trusted to be 13 foot tall. You get it? He's cutting us down to size. It isn't about a big story of, you know, angels and men fathering, comes kind of weird, you know. It isn't really about that. It's about God cutting the man down to size, you see. And, and, and God, who, who is wanting to preserve a, a godly line, who sees it, it disappearing, and, and he's got to, to intervene in order for his grand purposes to, con to continue. So what is verse 1? It's just saying there were giants in the earth in those days, and also afterward, because we do read about them afterward. And it's also just saying, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, when, when the, those in the godly line saw the daughters of men, they, they did just as much as, as what Cain did. Cain, through Lamech, through, through the line, fathered someone like Lamech, who is a bully and a boaster, and I did this, oh wife, I did that, oh wives, Zilla, oh wives, Adela, whatever name, you know. 
Cain was avenged seven, I'm going to be avenged 77 fold. And sadly, the sons of God were just the same. They became men of renown. I am a great hunter. I killed a dinosaur and it was 40 foot tall and whatever. And I've killed a hundred men, you know. And I've built a city and I've done this. And, I, and they, they were proud because they lived 900 years and they could get away with it, you see. Got to cut them down to size. Got to limit the amount of sin that they can do. And we end up in the Middle Ages where men, men, you know, you're lucky to live 50, won't you? You know, we should be very thankful that, that we might live to 60, 70, 80, 90 in this age. But let it not be a, a life filled with sin and bringing rack and ruin on the earth, you know. So, so be careful about, about that kind of a weird um, interpretation. But, but behind this then is a, is a principle, isn't it? That he is reminding us that just like um, Cain's line went astray by intermarriage, multi-wives and all this kind of thing, God takes marriage as a precious thing because from the very beginning it was a, it was a picture. Eve taken from Adam's side, joined back. The, the two being joined will become one flesh. And this is a, a great mystery, Paul says. It speaks of Christ and the church, that there's something within marriage that points towards God and his relationship with man and God the Father and his relationship with his son as well and how the son uh, has given his life for the bride and so on. And, and this is a precious picture which he wants to retain within society and mankind. And so we see throughout the Old Testament this uh, instructions not to go and marry unbelievers. Don't, don't, when they come into the land, they're not to marry the pagans of the land because they'll get corrupted and so on. And what do we see them do? They marry the pagans of the land and they get corrupted, don't they? And, and you know, we, we, we don't live quite under that, but we still live under the same principle, don't we? Even in the New Testament, to the believers, it says, be ye not unequally yoked. If you're a Christian, marry a Christian. Don't marry an unbeliever. It's, it's you're playing with fire. Don't even court them because it's not worth it, you see. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, we are only to marry in the Lord if we are Christian. That's speaking to those who are widows whose husbands have died. Yes, get married only in the Lord is what it says there, you see. That that's, that's, that's the realm of our freedom, but not to marry outside. So, so marriage is an important thing, the principle of of keeping a kind of faithful line of God's people, passing on the faithful heritage and so on is really important. And, and I think we can just pick that up as a little excursus there. I didn't want to kind of come through Genesis and jump over verse 4 and you say, Pastor, I've got a question. But, you know, well, let's, well, at least we've dealt with it there. Okay. So now let's turn to the main theme. What does God do when enough is enough and when mankind has gone too far? Well, firstly, from this passage, we see God limits, doesn't he? And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. When God sees wrong and evil being perpetrated, he does act to limit, thankfully. And here in verse 3, we, we read of his spirit striving with ungodly mankind. He's vexed with what mankind is doing. It's troubling his heart. And so he sets a limit upon them. Again, we were looking at this in Sunday school. There's two ways of interpreting this limit. Either he's talking to Noah and saying 120 years between now and when the flood comes, that there's a, only a length of time, or he's saying no one's going to live more than 120 years once I've dealt with the earth and so on. And, and we see pretty much very soon that that comes about. I was just saying that once you get past Abraham, the longest person living, as recorded in the Bible, is recorded as 123 years, you know which was Amram, an ancestor of Moses. So, uh, and there is one other guy, I think, who, who lives the same, the same length of time in uh, the days of one of the kings. So, uh, 120 years to the flood, or an upper limit of uh, living 120 years, God, either way we interpret that, he's limiting. His time scales are his own, though, aren't he? We might say, oh, Lord, interact. In, you know, intervene, please act. And we're looking across the news, uh, you know, half an hour later to see if he's acted. Well, well, God's timing is a bit different than ours, doesn't it? You know, 120 years 
is actually God acting quite quickly in, in, in his terms because he's very, very patient. We may think things are getting worse and worse, but in actual fact, we never know what God is doing behind the scenes to prevent things from being even worse, do we? We only know what takes place, but God knows everything that could take place, doesn't he? And we never know what little push, what, what little nudge, what little thing, what little, you know, puffs, he puffs it and, and he just changes the direction of things just to make sure that things do not get as bad as they could be and so on and brings about uh, his purposes, you see. We can be confident that now just as then God sees, God knows, and God limits. Though we may have to wait long to see things in God's time scales, you know. We see what go is going on in the news. Right now. It's, it's, it's awful, awful. We, we look at the people of Russia and think, you know, how on earth, you know, what a dreadful place to, to live and be contained in, you know. And how long has it gone on for? The best part of 100 years since the Russian Revolution or so on. But, you know, there might be another 100 years of that yet. Uh, but it could well fall in its time. God can bring about that change and, 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 and who knows what, what, what that change might bring. Paul says this in Acts 17, 26. God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. We're all brothers and sisters and related and united physically, aren't we? And has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. So we're not only related, but God also has, has, uh, uh, has his mind on the nations and has appointed their times and their boundaries and their habitations, how long they might live for and so on. He does this so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. A, that's a text on God's sovereignty over the nations and over the peoples and over the boundaries and over the times. And he is in charge. Paul is confident. We should be confident. And furthermore, in, in terms of God limiting, we see him limiting the age here. If we were to jump ahead to chapter 9 and verse 6, when Noah and his sons eventually emerge from the ark into the cleansed world, in Genesis 9, 6, it says this, God, in giving him his covenant, he says, whoever sheds man blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. And in this uh, uh, context here in chapter 9, we see that in the instructions given to Noah, from then on in this new world that they're going out to inhabit, this cleansed world, it's not completely new in that sin still remains, but we get the beginning of government there. We get the beginning of, 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 of courts and of law. If somebody kills another man, they deserve to be killed. Well, clearly that needed to be developed at some point to, to, to work out how to arrest and how to, to question and did this happen and are you the person and, and find the evidence and so on. And we have there the, the, the very beginning of what we would call human government. And Romans 13 reminds us, doesn't it, that this is a way that God limits evil in the world today. God uses human government, doesn't he? Whether it be kings, presidents, police forces, armies, and so on. Now, they don't, they don't act perfectly in every way, but they are there to arrest the murderer, to try them, to bring them to court, to deal with justice. It's not perfect, is it? We accept that, but it's there to restrain evil. And so we are generally told, aren't we, to submit to that unless, of course, it is directly in opposition to uh, the commands of the Lord Jesus. And there's not many uh, in which we would see an opposition to those things, but they do occur from time to time. So the Lord limits. What else do we see here? We see the Lord grieves. Back to chapter 6 and verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. God sees and he grieves over these things also. God's heart is grieving when, when, when cities are pounded and, and people's lives are taken and buildings collapse and, and, and crush innocence underneath. He grieved 
over the ancient world, which was so filled, filled so soon with cruelty and violence. It says he was sorry. He regretted making mankind. It's put in human terms here, isn't it, that we might understand God's heart by the, own, by the feelings of our own heart about these things. And, uh, 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 and that, that we should see that God is not untouched by the wickedness of mankind, but sees and feels its impact strongly. Because God never made mankind to do this in the first instance. This is, this is what we became following sin and the entrance of sin. This is, this is what came following our rebellion and our corruption, isn't it? The human mind became dark. The heart became hardened against God, against truth, against our fellow man. And this is why man does awful things to other men. And women to women and men to women and women to men and, you know, world to world, isn't it? Nation to nation. This is why this goes on and it grieves God's heart too. I suppose this is why we're called to love one another, isn't it? That this is, this is the opposite of hatred and cruelty and so on, that we might love and be characterized by that. Just because God has not intervened in a direct and visible way, don't think that he is indifferent. He sees the injustices going on. He notes these things. He sees these things. He will intervene. He grieves in his heart over them. He goes about to limit them. Thirdly, here we see the Lord speaks. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. And um, verses 12 and 13 too. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. It's noticeable in this whole passage, whilst we think of it as the passage about Noah, and it is, we learn of him and of what he must do. He's not, in fact, the primary actor in this chapter at all. It is God who speaks, verse 3. It's God who sees, verse 5. It's God who grieves and is sorry, verses 6 and 7. And it's ultimately God who speaks, to pronounce condemnation on the world in verse 7 and in verse 13. Noah says nothing. He just, go, he just does what he's instructed. But he doesn't say anything. Why? Because it is God alone. It is the creator and maker of the ends of the earth. He alone has the right to call time. He, he alone has the right to say enough is enough. He alone who made it has the right to destroy it. We, we don't. He does. And it is he alone who will come up with the remedy for this broken world as well. He pronounced doom, doesn't he, here, upon the ancient world. He's also pronounced it on our world too, hasn't he? You just look up the references to the day of the Lord. You know, get your concordance out, look up Day of the Lord, piece it all together, and he's spoken about the end of this age as well. It's coming, isn't it? But just as we see here, and just as we see in Amos, because Amos is also about the Day of the Lord, but an earlier kind of day, you see these things lead up to the big crisis Day of the Lord. Just as we see in Amos, God speaks before he acts. God warns, doesn't he? Just like you do as a parent, Reuben. Don't touch the oven, it's hot. You're going to get your fingers burned. And he tells you, and she tells you, you know, are you listening, Reuben? You see, you have to listen so you don't touch and get your fingers burned. You see, there's a warning there. If you do that, I'm going to take away this toy. And they do it. If you do that, again, I will take away this toy. Believe me. And they do it. And so you take away the toy, don't you? And, and it, it's similar isn't it with God? He, he doesn't want to catch us out. He wants good behavior, doesn't he? But he knows mankind's nature. And so he knows there's really only one crisis that must come 
as a judgment upon it. But he warns and he warns and he warns. In Amos, the Lord roars from Zion is how it begins, isn't it? And so here he pronounces what will be. I'm going to bring a flood. It's going to cleanse and purge the earth. He forewarns what will come. And we're to heed the message, aren't we, that we might turn in time and not be overtaken in the crisis. Here's a day of the Lord passage. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. He doesn't just speak. He even, he even blows the trumpet. The sound of warning. Ring the bells. Make the siren. You know, we've heard it, haven't we, on the news here. Warn the people of what's coming. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. And, you know, of course, there was a day of the Lord that they were facing there when Nebuchadnezzar or the Assyrians uh, came and brought a short-term judgment, as it were, upon the people but uh, of the land, uh, Israel. But we're reminded, aren't we, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Becoming the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light. You see, you're, you're of a different line if you believe in the Lord Jesus. You are sons of light. You are sons of the day. We're not of the night. We're not of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others. Let us watch and be sober. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and of the helmet, the hope of salvation. Why? Because God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You see, God speaks. He warns. He tells ahead of time what's going to happen, that we might take advantage of that, that we might find our way back to God if we've drifted from him, that we might find God if we've never turned to him, that we might be faithful and keep on in the troubled day uh, uh, and time. So the Lord limits, the Lord grieves, the Lord speaks a warning, doesn't he? And we should heed that message. And finally, here in this, in this passage from verses 14 through to 22, really, the Lord makes a way of salvation. God pronounced that he would destroy the wicked world and the earth and, and the wicked of the world and the earth with it. And it will be no different in the future for those who are not ready at his coming. We're told in 2 Peter chapter 3 that what God has done once with water, he will do next time with fire. Go and read it. The element shall melt with fervent heat, is how it's described there. He will purge the world. He cleansed and washed it once. He's going to purge it with fire on the second time that he might make all things new. But just as then, and just as now, there is always a way of escape that we might have hope. Because God isn't pleased to destroy everything that he has made. He isn't delighted that people should perish in their sin without a way out. And so Noah is told to build an ark, a ship made out of wood, covered in pitch, uh, with, with these many floors and these many uh, stalls or rooms, so that it was not only sufficient to keep alive a pair of each uh, of the kinds of animals, but had space for plenty of people too. Someone has calculated that the, that the ark was half empty. I don't know whether that's true or not, but they've sat there and worked it out because there was plenty of space that people could have got on there. But in the, in the end, there was no people who heeded the message to get on. Just Noah and his family. And we see in this provision of a way of salvation, just some patterns that are repeated in other places. Firstly, that God chooses a man. Noah found grace in the eyes of God or in God's sight. God chose him to be the one through whom his plans of salvation would prevail. Here, in this generation before the flood, if there was anyone that they needed to look to, it was Noah. It was Noah that they needed to listen to. It was Noah that they needed to follow, wasn't it? He was God's man on the ground 
right at that time. If they, if they wanted to be saved from the flood, they needed to heed what Noah was saying and get on that boat with him when God said, it's time to enter the ark. Later on, it's Abraham, isn't it? Later on, it's Joseph. If you're going to be provided for, you've got to listen that Joseph is alive in Egypt and come down and eat the food. He will provide for you. He's the savior, you see. Later on, it's Moses. Later on, it's King David, isn't it? Each in their time pointing towards the ultimate one after whom there would be no need for another because there is one name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved. And it's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Now that, now that the seed is, now that the plan has come all the way to the point where the promised seed has been born, the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we don't need to look past him. He's the one, you see, to whom they all pointed. He is the way to God for all nations, for all time, through him. And he came to give his life a ransom for many. And he went to prepare a place for you, didn't he? And he will return to gather his people to himself to deliver them from the wrath to come. And so in our age, it's not Noah that we listen to, but it's the lesson of Noah we listen to. It's not Moses that we listen to, but it's the lesson of Moses we listen to, isn't it? In our day, it's the Lord Jesus Christ to whom we must look all the ends of the earth. God chooses a man, and that man he has appointed is the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And God covenants a means as well in verse 18. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. For people to be saved and delivered from their sin in that day, they needed to heed Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and by faith enter the ark that he was making there. For the people of Israel in Egypt, they needed to heed that Moses was the one whom God had raised up and by faith follow his instructions to keep the Passover and to follow him through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. If they didn't, they died in the plague or they, they would have, you know, not made it through the ocean, would they? They needed to stick with him. And we see at these points in history that God makes a covenant or an agreement with his people because without one, we have no basis of standing before God or way of escape. You know, people are drifting through life just thinking, oh, well, I've lived a fairly good life. It's no different than my neighbors over there. And, you know, it, it, will, what, it will be what it will be kind of thing. And they've got no concept of the reality of what lies ahead. I've got no understanding that actually you need to be in agreement with God. You need to be in covenant with God. If you're just saying, hey, I've lived a fairly good life and so on, well, then you're, you're appealing to the covenant of the law. And the law says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy strength, thy soul. Oh, yeah, can you tick that box? You know, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Oh, yeah, you, you never sworn in the, in the Lord's name. And you shall keep the, the Sabbath and so on. You shall not bow down to any, any idols. Oh, we've got plenty of idols, haven't we? And it speaks about lies and murder and covetousness and theft and so on. Well, if you, if you want to be judged by your works, which is what the covenant of the law is, you, we're in trouble, aren't we? But Christ came and he fulfilled that covenant. The covenant was, we were told within that covenant, I will bring about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it's the Lord Jesus who came and satisfied that covenant who, who, who lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, who, who suffered for all the wrongdoings that we did, who, who died there on the cross to bear the penalty because for the wages of sin is death, but who thankfully also was raised up from the grave to the right hand of God the Father to show that all of that which was stacked against us has now been reconciled with God. And we can relate to God, can't we, under the new covenant. This is the covenant in my blood, says the Lord Jesus, as he offers eat and drink, which we're going to be reminded of in a moment. You see, if we're to have peace with God and deliverance from the wrath of the judgment to come, we must come under a God's covenant to be able to look to him 
And, and we are told, aren't we, that just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness and people looked towards that by faith to be saved, even so the Lord Jesus will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, Lord Jesus, the, the, we only need to look to him, don't we? To come under the covenant of grace, which the Lord Jesus came to establish for us. So look to him. You know, the Lord has made a way of salvation. Will he intervene in the world? Will he? Yes, he limits. Yes, he grieves. Yes, he has spoken about what he's going to do. But between now and then, We've got to be very careful about saying, hurry, Lord, hurry, Lord, because in, in the hurry, Lord, so many people are going to still be lost. No, in a way, we should be saying, thank you, Lord, for your patience, because there might still be another murderer today who finds forgiveness tomorrow through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's possible, you see. Right now, what's more important is not justice upon all the wickedness going on in the world that will come what's more important right now is that we each find forgiveness for our own sin before that great day and help others to find forgiveness for their sin before that great day that's both our need but also the need once we've found that in the lord jesus the need of our neighbor we might love them and help them to find their way to him. Well, let's close in prayer this morning as we think about these things. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Heavenly Father, that your heart is touched by the awful things going on in the world. Lord, you're able to raise up and to bring down you are able to exalt and humble. And for whatever reason, you've permitted a, a very powerful man. And, and across the world, across history, powerful men have come to powerful, prominent places and done we, if, wicked and evil th things. But in reality, they're no different to, to any one of us, really. Loving Father, we thank you that there is great mercy with you. You are able to bring these things to an end. You will act at a time that you have chosen, you have determined to bring about that final culmination of all things. You have promised, I will destroy those who destroy the earth. But loving Father, we know that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so you are long patient with us that many might find their way to the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord to realize our need before that terrible day ahead. That we might know that we're forgiven and therefore that day ahead is no longer terrible, filled with foreboding, but is filled with the glorious hope and expectation of the Lord's return to deliver us from the wrath to come. We pray, Father, for our family members, our neighbors, our those that we know, those that we love to see come to know you. Lord, give us boldness to share with them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might come to him, that they might come to him uh, through our testimony and our walk, through our words, uh, through your word, which speaks of what is to come, Lord, and of what they must do to be saved. Oh, Lord, be with us. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, to your good intent. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.